we actually had to make a little bit of an adjustment for the uh, amount of people who registered. Uh, yeah, so we just wanted to say thank you for everyone who's, who came. And thank you to um, um, our sponsors and so on. Uh, I just want to um, say something about the logistics. The bathroom is down here, um, just to the side behind me. And lecture room four is a little bit of a question <laughs> to get to. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, you go down the hall here, you turn left, and then there's an elevator that you take up to the sixth floor, then you turn right and left again, all the way down to <laughs> the corridor. And that'll be, you'll find it there, lecture room four. Right? <laughs> 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 job um, of organizing things. Special salute to Alex for leading the team and also for every other guy that is working on, on the project. And also I'd like to thank our sponsors. A very big thank you to them because without them
Anyway, so I'm not going to go too much into details here. My, 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 I just want to quickly mention Cortex Logic. I, I'm not sure if they were mentioned as one of the sponsors, but we are one of the sponsors. Um, and what we are trying to do is to help uh, basically provide an AF engine for, for businesses. And the reason I mention that, we live in it, and we're going to talk about the foundations and the algorithms and, and everything. Um, but we've got such a rich toolbox that can deal with structured, unstructured data. And you can, and, and I think the challenge is how to build end-to-end um, solu -end solutions, how to operationalize big data analytics, um, how to um, work with unstructured data. And that's why if you look at what we've got available right now, especially with deep learning, um, just the ability to work with video, text, audio. And I'm going to show some biomedical applications just as part of the applications part. And I actually pre presented this yesterday at the SABEC 2018 conference. Um, but it's fascinating to see what people are doing to actually solve problems, say for instance for drug discovery. Um, and I will talk a little bit uh, about that as well. Now, uh, just quickly with, with, with Cortex, um, so as I've mentioned, we've got this rich toolbox. So we live in the API economy, it's plug and play. There's a lot of commercial APIs, there's a lot of open source stuff, people are doing their proprietary stuff, we're putting solutions uh, together at lightning speed, and, and it's really, the, the problem you need to solve is, is to say, how do we take this and integrate this into a business to address business KPIs and help solve problems? So for me, data science and AI shouldn't be just stuck in modeling. So we're going to talk about that quite a bit here. But it's really about creating that smart foundational layers. Then if you've got rapid access to all data, structured, unstructured, you can create automatic AI, and then you can actually, from there, integrate into the business. And that can go into all sorts of things. It can go into intelligent virtual assistants. Intelligent virtual assistants can do sentiment analysis, for instance, feed information back to the data lake. And then you can improve your models again. So it's a constant stream of uh, uh, getting more and more data and creating these small data layers so that you can actually create valuable solutions for customers. So, and, and it's really around, you, if you look at a thriving business, optimized business, satisfied customers, productive employees, smart systems, there's so many things uh, that one can do. And, and also from a non-profit perspective. So we've got the MIA here that's really focused on using these technologies and it's growing with lots of partners. And I just want to quickly mention, um, Alex and, and Chris was part of the organization committee, but one of the great highlights of last year was a, was a hackathon. And the winner of the hackathon is actually here, Yandere Mare. So where, Yandere, where are you? There we go. And, and it was a vision problem. And Alex and Chris was awesome in helping to, to set it up, set up the problem. And we actually had, I think it was 100 people there. Uh, participating and that's the kind of things that we want to do with MIA, support those kind of things, <coughs> collaborate with the deep learning in Davos, with all sorts of AI conferences across Africa and the world. I've just been invited by uh, United Nation, Nations to also present next month at AI for Good um, and there was last year also AI and inclusion in Rio de Janeiro. So there's a bunch of stuff happening, very exciting stuff. We're getting corporates that's getting involved. Um, so it's, it's great. And what we want to see, we don't want to see Africa left behind. So it's very important that we network together, people like us, to actually make a difference. So that's why I'm so excited about this conference as well um, and, and doing the things there. If you want to find out more about MIA, you can just go to the Machine Intelligence Africa report website. Okay, I'm going to skip all of this. We know AI is here. So, uh, and we know AI is affecting all industries, enterprises, industry, or, or everything there. So. Um, I'm just going to skip that. I want to go straight to um, deep learning. So, to the foundations in the interest of time. Okay, so if you look at the history of AI, um, well, it probably dates back at least to Alan Turing, 1950s. Early AI stirs excitement. And um, I got involved, obviously, in, in the 90s, late 80s, 90s as well. So, I just saw this amazing stuff happening here. And I wanted to get involved in machine learning and AI. And it was amazing to see this. And also talking about back propagation and all these kind of things. But it was really still the AI winter. So it was, a, it was an interesting period. And, but it was still enough power to create incredible business value. So with my first company that I sold to General Electric, um, and I sold that in 2011, our focus was really on 
Um, applying this, especially in the industrial sector, manufacturing industries, industrial sector, also financial services. And if you think about the industrial sector, it's all about throughput, yield, quality. And the amazing thing is that all the basic machine learning toolbox, the SPMs, neural nets, made a massive difference and allowed the companies <coughs> to save millions of dollars. Just the percentage improvement in throughput and quality makes a big difference. General Electric is interested in predictive maintenance. Um, and they've got very expensive equipment, massive use cases. They've got billions of dollars of, of service agreements. That if you look at their jet engines, 2,000 sensors around that. You can monitor that in real time, and you can figure out when I need to do maintenance, uh, with, and you can schedule things. Um, the same with MRI scanners, locomotives, turbines, etc. So it's tremendous value, and, and we will a lot of value. But the amazing thing is, um, AI, you can apply it on that level, but with the breakthroughs that happen, we talk about 2010 up, it's with a real boom started because of big data, computing, improvements in algorithms. Um, the amazing thing there is the fact that um, we've got uh, tools that can deal with unstructured data in a proper way, text, video, audio. It was always traditional computer vision or other types of traditional algorithms that we use. But, but now, because of that, even on the human computer interface, we get AI applied right there to make a massive difference and impact, impact everything. So, so for me, it's not just unlocking insights, creating predictive models. It's actually on the human computer interface, intelligent virtual assistants, all of those type of things, which is very exciting. So it's almost like technology is now more adapting to us. <coughs> it's almost, we have to have keyboards and mouses and all sorts of stuff with the breakthroughs in AI, we will get to intelligent buildings and all sorts of interesting stuff that's, that's a, it will be amazing. We just need to shape, shape it in, in, in the right way. So quick definitions before I, as I go into deep, deep learning. Um, so machine learning, what is machine learning? Obviously a branch of AI, and it's really focused on systems that learn from data. That's it. So it's a very simple, holistic definition. And if you look at deep learning, deep learning is really focused on modeling high-level abstractions in data by using model architecture because of multiple non-linear transformations, such as building deep, deep layers and, and creating these high level of abstractions. And I will talk more about the various architectures and, and stuff as well. If you look at traditional programming versus machine learning, traditional programming, very simple. There's a computer, you've got data, you've got program as input, you need to create that, and you get output. If you look at machine learning, you've got your computer there, you've got abundant data, You've got your output, you need to say my labels, what I want to model, and then it creates the program. You learn the program. Um, if you look at AlphaGo, who knows about AlphaGo, AlphaGo Zero? Awesome. That's amazing. And that, that is an exact example of how you build engineer solutions. And that is using the good old fashioned uh, um, AI or even computer science with Monte Carlo search along with deep reinforcement learning. And just the way they combine that, create this amazing, super uh, human type of performance with regards to games. Obviously a constrained environment, but it shows the future. It's like the breakthrough moment, the repo moment. And we're going to see a lot of that. I've got one slide uh, that talks a little bit about the future and where things are going as well. So when we talk about architectures and algorithms and so forth. Okay, so in terms of uh, uh, machine learning basics, you know that some of you know this, I'll be fairly quick with some of this, I'll just watch the time as well. So if you look at uh, machine learning we talked about, obviously you're not programming things explicitly, so you start, start with data. In the training phase you need to have label data. So typically you do supervised training. And, you, and you've got a machine learning algorithm. And for me the interesting thing is, backprop was quite, people had all sorts of issues with backprop in the AI winter. It was just amazing to see how effectively it's been used now that we've got big data and we've got these smart architectures and little adjustments like Relu and skip connections and then all sorts of different things that just makes a massive difference. And uh, even though backprop is not biological plausible, if you think about from a, well, there's all sorts of arguments around that as well. But we need a lot of innovation around algorithms, especially unsupervised ones. The current unsupervised ones are just looking at clusters and maybe dimension reduction, feature extraction and stuff. So there's more that we should do on, on that front. Um, Okay, so, but anyway, so when you use this in a prediction, you feed the new data into the learned model and you get your prediction. 
So what are the different types? Uh, typically supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. So with supervised, you've got label data and examples of, for instance, say, email spam detector with training sets already labeled emails. So you know, if the spam is not, you train it, then it will detect that. Unsupervised would be, for instance, uh, looking at uh, similar kind of documents based on text content. <coughs> you can do topical modeling, you can do all sorts of different things, lots of interesting use cases around that. And reinforcement learning, the AlphaGo, Atari, well, that's an example of where that's been applied. But that's based on, and it's almost like semi-supervised -super because it's based on um, feedback or reward. So you learn to play the chess by, by winning or losing. Or if you look at the Atari game, you've got a score. So you know, you're going in the right direction or not. Um, and um, so, so that's how that works. The brain is obviously is, is quite a bit of reinforcement learning. So if you think about the problem types, uh, typically classification. So um, you take a bit, you classify A and B, or you do regression where you do stock prices or any, any specific uh, prediction. Clustering uh, is more descriptive. You break the clusters, you detect the clusters. And then anomaly detection is also an uh, unsupervised descriptive thing because you want to just detect when, when there's an anomaly. Um, so there's so many <coughs> fantastic material out there. Uh, at least one thing I could learn that talks about choose the, your estimator. And it also groups it into classification, regression, dimensional reduction, clustering. And that's effective. If you look at our standard toolbox, even with deep learning, it fits into these categories. You either use it for classification, for regression, um, and, and so forth. Okay, so I've covered that, I've covered so, so, that all of this. Um, so just in terms, I'm not going to talk too much about the basic machine learning stuff. There's obviously nearest neighbor, linear SVMs, decision trees, naive bays, this, and, and some of those techniques are still for, for the right problem is the right technique. Um, and uh, so for me, the way I'm looking at this is just a toolbox. Deep learning is not the best for everything. Um, um, so just look at that toolbox in a very sensible way. And as we've seen with the best stuff out there, it's sometimes an engineered solution where you combine say computer science or other types of things, AI potentially <coughs> with this. Um, okay, this is also quite, we're gonna talk about deep learning more, but if you map it, um, I don't know if you've seen this before, but this is a cool slide just showing shallow on the left, deep on the right, you talk about neural networks, and it's also showing all the probabilistic models uh, sparse uh, coding, deep link networks, restricted Wolf, Wolfman machines, um, Gaussian mixture models, it's all part of that. But then going to supervise, supervise on the sides, unsupervised in the middle, um, and it's just showing some of the techniques. So I'm going to, in this talk, just further, I'm going to just uh, talk more about the current neural nets, evolution neural nets, uh, those type of things that's very topical. So there's also these. Um, kind of uh, neural networks in the zoo. So you get, uh, um, if there's enough time, uh, we'll see if there is. I want to dig into some of these architectures and, and just talk a little bit about some of these things as well. Um, and uh, this is a really cool article. This is not showing, by the way, they say this is the most complete chart of neural nets. It's not okay. showing everything. <laughs> so, but um, they don't even show reinforcement learning here. And some people say this reinforcement learning, but it's clearly neural net. But anyway, but, but this is, Good to spend time um, on this, and just to there's actually a good website um, that just goes through, goes through this as well. Okay, so deep learning. So I've uh, so let's just quickly briefly talk about that. Inspired by the brain, the first hierarchy of neurons that receive information in the visual cortex are sensitive to very specific edges within the brain regions, V1, and then. Further down, the visual pipeline is more sensitive to more complex structures such as faces. So that is an interesting clue because obviously if you look at convolution of neural networks, that's exactly what we're trying to do. You first take edges, then you put some of these edges together and create little subcomponents, and then you can say, okay, this is this little object and maybe part of this bigger thing. So it's creating these high level of abstractions um, and, and creating those, generating those features. But if you look at neural networks, it's all, it's all about storing, where's that information stored? It's stored in the connections, it's stored in the synapse, the strength of that synapse uh, to the brain, specifically. Um, and it seems like they talk about the one learning algorithm hypothesis, all significant mental elements are learned except for the learning and reward machinery itself. So there's definitely something there that's similar. If you look at the auditory cortex, the visual cortex, it seems like there is something um, that's, that's similar, that's repeatable. 
And, and this is just quickly showing the neurons in the brain, and, and this is a very simplistic um, model um, of, of what's happening with, with uh, uh, the neuron. Who knows adaptive resonance theory? R. Okay, nobody did this, this view. So actually Boeing used that as well in the 90s as well. Stephen Grosberg, Gal Carpenter, and I almost did my PhD in that area as well. Maybe it was a good thing I did. But what they did, they really looked at mathematical, the mathematics of how that works. And, but it got too complicated. Too, too, it, it, it really it worked for a bit, but it wasn't scalable. And we don't know, nobody knows about R anymore. Um, so if you look at all the stuff that we've got right now with all the architects and stuff, this is still very basic. The summations, you get all those signals coming in, you've got an activation function, um, and then you can make that available to other neurons, effectively, so on a very high level. Um, and you've got a bias, you've got a threshold, so the concept around when does this fire, so you've got, therefore you've got this concept of a threshold. Um, and a neuron, if you look at the real neuron, you talk about spiking neurons, where it's timing, or it only fires when, it, when there's enough energy to fire. Um, so, so there's, in fact, other types of architecture and algorithms where it's more closer to what the brain is doing. But anyway, this is working pretty well, as we've seen. All right, so lots of applications, speech, recognition, computer vision, natural language processing, and uh, there's the history. And maybe the only thing I want to say, Backrock was actually discovered in 1974 by Paul Barabos. I think a lot of people attribute Backrock to, um, to, I think it was Rubel Art in 1986 and stuff. But, and I actually met um, uh, Paul Barabos um, when we attended conferences that were still attending in the 90s, uh, early 90s and so forth, uh, conferences and so forth. But obviously, think that was still the AI uh, winter. Things have changed. Uh, I think what has changed here, for instance, in 2010, I think with uh, specifically, if you think about vision. So what you see in the blue there is the traditional computer vision and applied to um, ImageNet, the Computer Vision World Cup. And since 2012, you can see the breakthrough there. 2013, 14 was just deep learning, convolutional neural nets, just ruining it. Um, if you look at what Microsoft has done with speech recognition as well, um, this is, you can see the same kind of things, where you see those error rates dropping down to um, human um, acceptable levels, um, which is amazing. So why deep learning? Obviously, it's, uh, I think it's about data, so you can actually do more of the amount of data. If you look at this traditional machine learning techniques, you've got stuck with, it doesn't matter how many data you feed it, it you can't extract, it's not expressive enough. Um, and with deep learning, that changed the ball. The difference has changed the ball game. Um, okay, so we've talked about this, so computational power, all of that. So let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, the deep learning basics. Um, and here is actually a nice diagram just showing this is a convolutional neural network it's using a hierarchy of layers and in, in a high level way, just looking up with the visual cortex. You can see V1, V2, V4, IT, the different layers. And, and how the data is being transformed, uh, transforming the input data on every layer to create abstract notation, going from edge, nose, to face, for instance. Um, and if you look at the back to basics around these kind of things, is this is, you create these kind of little layers, input uh, little layers, and you can stack it up. Um, what do you think is the, okay, but, okay what, I just want to get, who has trained neural networks with more than 100 layers? Wow. What application did you use there? Financial. Financials. Financial. Wow. What kind of network was that? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm going to talk. I've got slides to talk about. Uh, you can get to those kind of um, uh, layers if you, um, especially if you use um, residual or dense or stick connections as well, because of the vanishing gradient. I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. Then you can actually go as, uh, as big as you want. Well, that's amazing because it was a problem. And obviously with computational power and data, there's no uh, issues on that front. So um, I think one of the big things, uh, I've showed that, uh, look at the a neuro, a specific neuron, I think one of the, the things that, that made a big difference was, was really around um, um, using proper nonlinear activation functions. And there's a bunch there. There's sigmoidal functions being used, fun edge, Relu soft plus for various purposes. <coughs> and even if you look at LSTM's recurrent neural networks, you will see sigmoidal used there because there's a specific purpose. But 
if you think about um, the problem with them, if you think about going deep, is is um, the gradient. If you look at the derivative of the activation function, if you look at relative, it gets to what, and you don't get vanity, you don't get these small numbers you multiply with one another, you get to very small uh, weight updates. So that's why it's all about vanishing gradients. So, and it's it's all about weight updates. Um, so let's just uh, uh, dig into that a little bit more. So. Um, if you look at back propagation, it's effectively using stochastic gradient descent, and there's multiple ways of channeling that, of working with that. So you get SUD, you've got, you get momentum that's actually pushing it in the right direction. And what you're trying to do is, you're trying to obviously you've got a loss function, and you want to optimize the weights. Um, um, you want to say, you want to actually figure out what is the contributions of each weight in this neural network to the error. And the way to figure that out, obviously, if you if you uh, push the data through the system, you get your result. You've got your error on the top layer, and you want you want to feed that back. You want to actually say, okay, now the, the problem is to say, how should I actually who's responsible for this and this and this and this? And, and, and you basically handle that, and, um, and 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 that's the you know, highest level, if I um, to to get to. Um, um, the, the best, best possible solution there. But effectively what you want to do is to get to the, the, the local minima where the error is as small as possible for given all, for all the weights. Effectively. And sometimes you get stuck for certain of them either. So, um, and if you think about from a transformations perspective, um, so if you look at a two-dimensional layer, then uh, on the two-dimensional uh, uh, level, you want to separate these kind of things. You can see if I create high level transformation where I just pull this up and um, you can actually create a separation with almost linear separation on a high level. So this is a nice diagram just showing what kind of transformations is possible in other types of dimensions. You take 2D to 3D for instance. Um, just quickly in terms of some of the other deep learning stuff, so um, and, and a lot of the initial stuff was done by um, Jeff Nimpton around um, restricted Boltzmann machines and um, deep leaf networks where you use these kind of auto encoders where you, you use the inputs you, and you can use those as outputs as well so there's your labels and you create a, a system where it looks like this where you actually create a compressed feature vector vector and with that vector that is like a representation that you can plug into a deep leaf network as well so you can actually use these auto encoders along with supervised so this is kind of unsupervised because it's you've got your um, your input, you just use it to output, but you learn features, and then you can plug it in. And this is some of the initial breakthroughs um, that was that was great. And some of these applications for autoencoders is like topical modeling. You can use it as is, and um, where you've got a document and you want to uh, basically what you do there is you just want to um, uh, sort all the documents that is close to one another. And you want to put them because they belong to the same topic, and you can use uh, deep autoencoders for those types of applications. So if you look at deep learning primitives, um, fully connected, convolutional, recurrent neural nets, I'm going to dig into that now. So if you look at convolutional neural nets, I've spent, I've shown some slides already on this. So this is just again showing the example um, around uh, recognizing faces. And Alex in his talk, I'm sure he's like putting me on all these kind of image vision stuff. So he's going to show you a bunch of these applications on using this type of um, technology for various things. I'm going to show a little bit of applications at this time on, on the biomedical front as well, where this has been utilized. Um, so, so effectively what you have here is a convolutional layer and a pooling layer. So the convolutional layer is, is really a feature detector, so it's filtering out the new information. And I've got this slide here that's actually showing that. So if you look at, uh, basically if you take the script and you slide it over this image, and basically you learn these filters, these convolved uh, features, and as you go across it, you try to summarize and get extract information. So in this instance, if it's say uh, uh, just zeros and ones, and you've got uh, a specific filter, but you can't see the whole thing here. But it, it tries to pick up where where it's a match, and then it just sums it up, multiply and sum, and you get your extraction there. So you, you've got you've got a number for that. That's effectively what's what's happening on a high level with convolution. But with pooling, what you try to do is to max the average value of that particular feature of the region, going from, say, 6 to 3 or 4 to 2, and you and you uh, grade these kind of downsizing of the images. And that obviously helps uh, as well, uh, reduce the memory sizes and stuff like that. Um, 
But I think if you look at, obviously, if you even look at Roy, and maybe it's unfair this, this as well, um, the slide, so hey, it's still dumb, but this is exactly it. When they look at the picture, it sees that. But if you look at a picture, in the first layers, it's doing some stuff there, but we, we just look at the end result, <coughs> and then we see it. But um, so, but, but this is exactly what it is, the way we look at it right now. Um, and this is just examples of some classification, and you can do use of captioning. I'm going to show some examples there as well. This is interesting, uh, some examples here, where you can obviously look at sentimentalism, or you can look at someone's face, you can see if there's joy, <laughs> if there's, they're happy. Uh, the one below is quite interesting. They actually, because they can figure out what is beautiful, I don't know, okay, for, for, for AI. And they, they talk about a beauty.ai 2.0 context. Welcome to the first international beauty context, just by AI. Um, which is fascinating. Uh, and, and there's even one to guess whether you're gay or straight from a photograph. Well, I don't want to go there, but anyway, um, so that's, that, that is uh, amazing. Um, anyway, so you can do a lot with convolution neural networks, and today there's going to be more in-depth talk about that and the applications. On the recurrent neural network side, obviously anything that's looking at sequences, time series, if you look at natural language processing, all of that is great applications. If you say you want to predict the next word, the clouds are in the sky, and then it predicts that word. Or you say, I grew up in France, and later on I speak fluent French, and, and it learns to predict those kind of things. The problem is, uh, is, is, is context, and how long can you remember? So, um, and with recurrent neural networks, and especially the ones that we work with, it's like, I don't know who knows Elman recurrent neural nets, the simple ones, yeah, those were the ones that we used in the 90s before, and, and, and Sweet Huber came out with LSTM's late 90s as well. Um, but, uh, and we use some of that simple recurrent neural networks in, in real world applications. And I think the time is not right yet for convolutional and LSTMs then. And obviously things changed in the 2000s, 2010s. Um, but anyway, so basically if you look at a recurrent neural network, you've got this connection that feeds back to the state. So you trust from the state and you can unfold it. And then when you unfold it, it's just like looking at, this is the, the previous time step, the current time step, the, the next time step. And, and you, you've got a state, you've got inputs coming in, but you'll also remember what the previous state was. Um, and clearly, the, the human brain is making use of the current neural nets on multiple levels, a lot of feedback and all sorts of connections. So we need to get better algorithms to train these kind of uh, uh, neural nets. So currently, it's obviously backdrop still being utilized there. Um, so, so basically, it learns sequences. Um, and, and I thought this is also good. We the design patterns of the current neural networks. So you can do one-to-one, of course, -one image classification as well, but image captioning where you've got uh, the red here is one. Uh, to, to look at this uh, particular image, you've got this information, and then you want to generate a caption for that. Um, and then for that, you want to generate the output sequence. Um, so that is a one-to-many example. There's also many-to-one. You can use that, say, on text. You want to do sentiment analysis of this paragraph, and you want to see if it's positive, negative, neutral, and you can use it for that as well. Many-to-many -many is like machine translation. If you think about um, you've got something in French and you want to translate this to English. Or you want to classify image frame by frame. This is an example of you've, you've got an um, accident. Uh, for instance, you look at it uh, time zero to time one and you can actually train the system on those type of things. Okay, so deep learning basics. of the LSTMs, what was really cool here, and it's, and it's quite interesting, there's actually layers. All the, the gates in an LSTM is, is like a little neural network layer. So the introduction here was, um, I, I, first of all, I want to make sure that I can remember as long as I want to go back. So I need to have some sort of memory. So the introduction of a, a memory cell right there. But there's also um, the concept around input gates, forget gates, and output gates. So forget gates is actually looking at the previous um, cell's input on what information needs to come through. Um, and, and if you look at the, the input gate, is what what kind of information from the current inputs from the previous layer you do I need to, I need to, I need to, what do I need to bring in? Um, and then the output there is what should go to the next level, so, and to, to my next, my, my next in state. So, LSTMs, very powerful, memory cells read, write, reset operations, but then you get also gated recurrent units. 
where effectively the, um, the inputs and output gates are replaced by uh, update gate, just one gate, but more efficient. And then the reset goes like the forget go as well, just give you the ability to, to also do that. And here are some examples uh, where it's actually generating text. Um, so, and it's, and it's actually the word hello. And you can see an output layer, so you can see each of these characters, but it's very small. But basically it learns to predict the next character. So here on the input it's an H, and then it predicts the E. Uh, then the E, it predicts the L. And it's, it, you train the system effectively on that, and basically what it does is just to make sure that the other um, characters that's represented there is, 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 is um, reduced. Um, okay, um, and this is an example of where it's been trained to, um, to learn to, s to spell English words and, and uh, on Wikimedia Markdown. And it actually learned from scratch and copied the general syntax of the whole structure. So the whole thing there has been learned. Um, and this is quite interesting as well. When you actually examine the individual recurrent neural networks, you can see some of them are, or some of the cells, are more tuned to very sp uh, specific things. So the one on top here is just looking at uh, specific markdowns. Everything inside markdowns, everything in green, it gets excited. The one below is more looking uh, at URLs. And, and the red is actually what's the next letter, what's the next one. So, so it actually goes up that whole structure it figures out what excites it, what's, what it's looking for, and it also <coughs> looking at, at forward, uh, what, what it should predict. And there's, there's also context associated with this. And the cool thing is now you can actually start combining things, um, where you've got vision that can obviously see what's in the picture, and then you can combine that with recurrent neural network, and it's almost like AlphaGo, we've got reinforcement learning and Monte Carlo search. Here you're combining these, and you generate uh, descriptions and captions. And there's some examples here. You've probably seen this a close up of a child holding a stuffed animal, and, um, two pizzas sitting on top of a stove, top oven. Uh, it's amazing um, what you can actually get. There's some funny ones as well. The one on the right, the man flying through the air while riding in a skateboard. That, that is like very imaginative, but obviously it picked it up from training data. And this is, this is the closest you can get to that. But other things as well, so I'm sensitive about time as well. So I've got about seven minutes still. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> questions, questions. This, I didn't get even to the biomedical stuff, but there will be enough time to talk afterwards as well. So two minutes. So just to, um, uh, very important from a natural language processing is just the ability to create these embeddings as well. So if you think about dolphin, sea wall, purpose, uh, 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 purpose, sorry. Um, you can create these mathematical representation in multidimensional vector space of these words and concepts because they are occur together. You can actually um, um, create, you can actually pr uh, represent them in mathematical space and then do also the mathematical um, uh, stuff with with them. And examples of that is uh, here, for instance, where you say women minus man similar to on the Sanjo, king minus male plus female is queen, human minus animal is ethics. You can get that right because you've got this mathematical vector representation. Before anyone well. gets triggered by gender, pronoun, <laughs> yes. matters, yes. Can, we, can, yes. I wrap, can we wrap up or maybe just... <laughs> 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 he's, he's going to talk at 9.30, so... Uh, no, no, we, yeah, we see yeah. it because yeah. the, the video recording I think to the time, yes. so if it runs over, that's going to be very problematic, and we Perfect. still need to move people. So that's fine. That's just fine. Thirty seconds. No, no, no. Yes, yes, yes. Just to ask questions. Can, can yeah. people ask questions during the break and find you? Or fine. Sorry? It's we're fine. all going to be here. There's like networking yeah. stuff. It breaks. Okay. I'm, I'm really sorry. No, it's, it's um, fine. It's fine. Yeah. So, okay. so ready to stop right now? Well, well, okay, everyone. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>